Uh, today is Hypergraph 48. Um, that is 10 years older than I am. So uh, <laughs> I'm excited about today. We haven't done a technical talk in a long time. Um, this, to, this to me is really kind of the, uh, the preamble to what's to come in 2023. Uh, a lot of deployments, a lot of software deployments, hardware deployments, all coming out. And um, really today is to kind of align our community and what they can expect for 2023. Um, and so I'm here today with Alex and Ryle. Alex is our head of uh, engineering um, on the product deployment side. Uh, Ryle is our director of protocol engineering. And these guys are working together every day to mix and match technology to help each other kind of realize the roadmap and apply the roadmap and products to end solutions. Um, and so, but before I hand it over to Ryle, uh, kind of wanted to set the stage. So uh, about a few months ago in July, I wrote a piece from the CEO on kind of my perspectives on solving the blockchain trilemma. Um, this is a lot around com composability with Web 2 and Web 3. But ultimately, I, I took a perspective of talking about our design decisions at the core of Constellation and why we did what we did in building out our network and building out the vision of Hypergraph. Uh, and today is really that follow-on. Um, it's a follow-on from the CEO's perspective to the technology perspective and really the core design decisions that we've made on the protocol and why that matters uh, for, the, for today and for the future of applications that are building on Constellation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ryle um, to really start to, to paint that picture around what I talked about was the protocol, the FAT protocol uh, di dilemma. Uh, and Ryle actually planted this seed uh, back in 2018 when he talked at, uh, with Wyatt at TechCrunch. Um, and I think this is a rather new vision that we planted a long time ago, but I think it's going to be really important to hear uh, at the base of our core design decisions on why we started tackling the FAT protocol inversion. Um, so Ryle, I'm going to kind of hand it over to you uh, and I'll try my best to slow you down and add clarity or ask questions. Uh, but really this is kind of your, your moment to really talk to, to the community about the design choices that you've made. Uh, sure. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think, this has been discussed in a couple of different places where, you know, people have made this observation. Uh, you know, I, I think it's sort of obvious if you look at most of the existing platforms that uh, they don't share sort of, uh, you know, the same, this, the same uh, commonality with what you would expect from, you know, uh, the early internet protocol. Um, I think, you know, most of these things, uh, you know, Ethereum and most of the other platforms that offer code execution in contrast with Bitcoin or other, you know, pure currency uh, operations, uh, things that are targeting Web3, web um, they're typically capturing so much of the value in the platform itself that the application layer is a lot, uh, is, is sort of left out. Um, I think if you look uh, and think about what most of these platforms offer, they're essentially offering, you know, code execution environments with a very strict SDK where you can't actually sort of break outside the bounds of that in a lot of different ways. Um, I think this is, you know, part of the reason where, you know, when somebody is trying to create some sort of new application that offers some kind of new functionality, a lot of the time it's actually easier for them to uh, uh, essentially modify the entire protocol. I think we've seen sort of a lot of nice features in the development of different executors across some of these different platforms. You know, uh, you look at uh, any of the Rust or the WASM protocols that add in extra or additional functionality and they're go, sort of going in this general direction of opening up the platform, the, the platform or protocol more, so the application can do more things. Um, but I think this sort of general policy we see of uh, most of the value being captured by the platform itself is, in fact, an artifact of the restrictions associated with the platforms, um, because you know uh, most of the functionality has to be built into the platform itself. 
you know, if you look at in the case of a, a, you know Ethereum or Solidity, um, almost all of the features and functionality there are restricted within what you can do within the bounds of the EVM. The EVM is the essentially the ultimate arbiter that says this is what you can do, and anything that's not sort of not compatible with it cannot be done inside of it. Um, I think this is why you see, you know, uh, separate projects like Chainlink and all these other things that are dealing with integrations across it, because if you can't do something within the bounds of the EVM, you cannot do it at all. It's 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 sort of the reason why the, the, the EVM itself has become so valuable. Um, I think there are exceptions to this. You know, you look at Uniswap capturing massive amount of fees, all the other DeFi products, which uh are you know the the highest value captured by applications are 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 sort of these narrow narrow DeFi products that um uh you know they fit within the bounds of this operation um but uh they, they you know they themselves are, are relatively restricted i think if we're talking about sort of more complicated applications in the future um part part of the answer here is to look towards uh you know a conventional paradigm which is that the the you know the sort of protocol layer should not have a uh, sort of all of the responsibility. I think you know if you look at a you know conventional internet stack, most of the applications that are built on it can be vastly different. They can have huge amounts of customization and different uh, you know uh, different functionality. I think people have made the the analogy with email before. Uh, when talking about decentralized systems and crypto and blockchain um, in the past where, you know, uh, the email protocol, you can have any number of email clients, you can have any number of level of customization on top of that. And, you know, the, the approach we're taking nowadays is you have this one platform, it has a execution environment, it has a, you know, fixed SDK you can build against, you upload your artifacts against that, and it only works within that system which I think is sort of analogous to, you know, the equivalent of a Facebook platform where it can't communicate outside of that. And you have to have all these, you know, sort of, uh, you know, ridiculous bridges, almost like matrix bridges um, between each one of these little walled platforms. And uh, that just doesn't seem, uh, uh, it doesn't seem like a, like a decentralization effort. It, it, it almost seems like a failure of centralization within one of those, uh, within one of those areas. Um, and I think I think you know I'll I'll, I'll say that uh, I'll trace this issue directly back towards um, the sort of limitations of executors. I think in a perfect world, if if all the known problems had been solved, um, if we had these sort of perfect environments like Wasm that could handle oracles, if we had uh, you know much much more complicated executors, a lot of this behavior would. Uh, uh, you know, be lessened in impact, but the 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 fact is we don't. A lot of customization and uh, you know code portability is not easily jammed into one existing platform. There's not an, even an agreement on what the proper execution environment is for a lot of these things. Um, so I think really the effect you're seeing here, where it's it's very difficult for applications to capture this value that is obviously there over the platform itself is, um, you know, sort of directly connected to the, the the limitations and difficulty in the platform in expressing all of these things. So, Ryle, um, just for everybody that's on the calls, do you, essentially what you're, you're trying to preface is that why we're not seeing uh, Web3 applications composable with Web2 and the internet is because they're almost creating siloed Facebooks, if you will, and um, and thus, like you can't communicate outside of a Facebook. So why would Web two digital infrastructure be able to communicate with Web three digital infrastructure? Is that kind of right? Yeah, it's basically like if you commit to using Ethereum or or you know some other chain, um, you're locked into their their execution envir environment. It's a you know custom code. Um, I really think portability of these things is, is you know, going to be sort of the future between ex execution environments um, that are much closer to conventional code. I, I think the general trend towards WebAssembly has been pulling, uh, you know, separate code uh, from different languages, but I don't think it's really uh, sort of there in the sense that you can take uh, an existing project that uses uh, conventional programming languages 
and quickly guarantee, you know, remote code execution across different environments. I think the the sort of, you know, ultimate pipe dream future is where that's all handled automatically. But I think, it, you know, sort of in the interim, we, we need sort of a, a, you know, a different approach for handling that and trying to shift more of the re responsibility of the protocol um, down towards handling interop layers uh, and, and give the applications essentially more power and flexibility for customization. So I think the the sort of uh, you know immediate answer to this is um, giving applications more ability to uh, sort of uh, dictate operations and viewing protocols more as translation layers between separate applications, where the awesome. protocol can grow over time to encompass these sort of different behaviors in terms of rerunning and re-executing code. Um, but that's bounded, uh, uh, you know, purely by the execution environments that are available and sort of not application uh, specific level code. And I'll go into that in more detail. Uh, so again, I've seen, you know, one of the biggest questions I always get is, you know, so what what is the product? What is, what is Constellation doing? What, what, you know, why are you doing this? What is the justification behind it? Um, and I think it, it helps to sort of fit this narrative into existing products and existing uh, um, uh, projects that are in the decentralized space, um, because I think I've, you know, I've seen this many times before. There's sort of a distinction uh, where, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, Hyperledger Fabric or any of these other sort of uh, framework approaches or things that touch uh, on-prem deployments or, you know, uh, some of the case studies from Walmart or any of these other examples where they require uh, an, an excessive amount of customization. Um, I think this also touches, you know, uh, Oracle platforms and things like that, uh, where they deal with code that can't be run through a conventional uh, SDK or a conventional executor. Um, all these things are sort of grouped into a separation of something being viewed as an extensible framework versus, uh, you know, uploading fixed artifacts and binaries. So, uh, you know, most of the original uh, notion has built off of Bitcoin scripting language and viewed every single operation as a, a fixed binary that you're uploading. Like you have some script, you're pushing that script in there. Um, and I don't think a lot of people really sort of think about the ramifications of this and compare it to a conventional product. Um, we're talking about a lot of these things as applications, but this sort of heavy restriction here uh, is, uh, you know, uh, creates a lot of penalties and costs. You'll see that in, you know, admin keys that are ad hoc deployed to some of these contracts that allow upgrades or, you know, applications requiring regular upgrade patterns or all these other sort of limitations associated with that that have led to a, you know, this is not sort of uh, uh, us individually saying this, there's a large number of different products that have viewed this, uh, the solution to this is an extensible framework approach where you are, um, you know, building a customized application that is distributed, uh, sort of almost the equivalent of releasing a separate fork of Ethereum uh, that reuses a lot of the functionality, but has its own customization, its own extension that follows a conventional programming pattern. Um, you know, I think if you told uh, if somebody, if you told an app developer and they knew nothing about crypto, and you weren't describing to them a crypto problem, you were telling them they needed to build something out, and you told them that here's a database. You know, let, let's say they were using a Python script or something, and you told them here we've got this big database, and in this big database, I want you to uh, you know put a script in Python, and we're gonna we're gonna pickle that script in Python. We're gonna serialize the the state of that script in Python. It's a you know Python class, and uh, every time a request comes in. We're going to deserialize that from the database, you know, decode the binary artifact. Um, we're going to run some logic, a function, invoke a function on that script, and then we're going to update that, you know, that that script's class and, and update state x equals x plus one. And then we're going to reserialize that and restore it in the database. They, you know, if you told this to somebody who knew nothing about crypto or blockchain or anything like that, and they didn't know what problem they were solving, they would look at you and think you're crazy. Um, they would say that's not that doesn't make sense as an application. Why are we why are we uh, you know taking the state of this entire thing and reserializing it and storing in the database? They would think that's a, that's a little bit of a silly thing to do from a technical perspective. Um, now I, I, I say that you know 
not not trying to take down any of the the gains or the sort of uh you know beauty of bitcoin and ethereum's platform in terms of offering a real solution but more as just uh you know uh, viewing this in a different perspective um i think i think a lot of these uh you know sort of problems um have happened because of uh the you know some of the limitations associated with the executor environments it makes sense uh, if you don't have to think about the problems of distributing the code to different people, it makes sense if you don't have to think about it from an operational perspective. Um, but you, again, the, the, this is sort of a you know a separate product from uh, what a lot of people view as you know purely a platform where you upload binaries. Um, I think that is important to make as a distinguishment and to discuss you know sort of what the the goal of that is, and just just to give you know context. I think uh, a lot of people get confused because they think, oh, you know, what, what, what you know, like uh, you could compare that to something in, a, you know, Ethereum or another platform where you are um, essentially proposing some hash, and then you know you have a you know local local uh, process that proposes a hash to something that undergoes consensus, and that you know operation is sort of the equivalent of an extensible framework approach. I think you can consider these sort of one-to-one -one translations where. Um, if you had a separate sidecar car process that was running some custom code that, you know, takes this hash, pulls in a bunch of data, uh, does some sort of calculation on it, and then re-uploads the hash to a process that undergoes consensus and say, you know, do all the peers agree that this hash is correct? Um, that would be essentially the same thing. There's no essential difference other than the way the sort of code is organized. That, that makes it a lot more complicated. You'd have to have inter-process communication calls. You'd have to have something that is uh, essentially triggering on every consensus round, waiting for some value to come in and checking it against an external service. And that's how most of these oracles and bridge operations are constructed. Um, and, you know, we'll talk more about the sort of difference between like client validation and things like that. Uh, but, you know, the ideal future is where you could write this more closer to a conventional application. You can import um, these, you know, consensus primitives and you can uh, sort of deploy an entire customized application that has, uh, you know, so maybe logic that will not fit in, in, in a different SDK or a different platform. Um, and it can it sort of exist uh, as its own independent application that has all of these sort of bridging functionalities and connections to other networks sort of built in or baked into it. Um, the goal is really to make that a, a, as easy a process to use as possible that gets around some of the existing limitations. Um, and, and, you know, again, as part of this, we don't want to sort of, th you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater here. Right. Like the goal, you know, the most obvious criticism someone could instantly make is, OK, you know, you have an extensible framework, uh, you know, framework. Doesn't that just mean I've started up a completely separate and new network every time? Um, and the answer is, you know, depending on the configuration. Yeah. If you didn't connect it to an existing network, if there was no translation layer, if there was no way to run or execute or validate code, um, then, yes, it would be a completely separate network. But that's not sort of the goal. The goal is to sort of you know gain the best of both of these worlds um and the you know when i say that i i mean to have a sort of uh you know system that that connects the flow and application logic um but uh, towards uh you know whether or not portions of it are validated or not and i would say that's exactly the same model that you see in bridges in and oracle operations where um, you know, some uh, it requires us to sort of break up an application into portions of the data flow that can be considered uh, validated and secured by multiple parties, irrespective of whether or not they're running the platform versus portions that can't. You know, imagine I have some many stage pipeline where uh, I am talking about, you know, I have a data input source that is, uh, you know, the price of Bitcoin or something, or I have to, you know, query from an external source to get it. It's something that's a non-reproducible or uh, code customized source of data. And then I have a function that takes that non-reproducible data, something that's that requires a framework approach to, to, to handle. Um, and then I have some function that takes that value and does plus one to it. Well, all the, you know, if I, um, if I have a single platform, 
uh, I would have to split up the code in, in this, this sort of horrifying way where, you know, I have an inner process communication call that does one of these things. I then take the value of I decode it. I have a separate fixed smart contract that does that. I feel like, you know, a lot of those steps should sort of be automated where the plus one operation is something that you can reproduce. Um, it's something that can you can gain the security of as many peers as possible that run the common translation layer uh, in order to gain validation of it. Uh, the initial operation it, it is not easy to reproduce. It requires a peer subset that is for running specific separate code. Um, and this, this is essentially exactly the same issue you run into with bridges. Uh, so the, the current patchy fix for this problem is essentially you have, uh, you know, I will say there are, you know, some of these, uh, you know, zero trust bridges, uh, which essentially, you know, it's a little bit of a marketing term in the sense that it's zero trust because it relies on a peer subset. Um, if you have one of these bridge operations between two nodes, you can have some of the actual logic and state re recreation logic embedded in the, in the contracts and fixed contracts, but you're still fundamentally limited by the peer subset that knows about the code of each different network. To get, you know, sort of a perfect bridge, you need a node running both um, uh, both networks versions of code. And those things are subject to hard forks or subject to updates, which means you need them to keep the, those things up to date. Even if, if you have a fixed contract associated with it, um, there are some that I've seen that, uh, you know, deal with light clients that are embedded inside the contract that still runs into the same problem of you need that light client, client to query another peer subset. So every single one of these is, is falls into the same security model, which is you don't have a one size fits all. You do not have every node on the network validating every single piece of data. You have a fractional approach where there are different groups of peers that have validated different groups of data. And your security model changes now um, uh, into something close, close, closer to a marketplace. So rather than a you know, single source of security, uh, you have you know, different groups of peer subsets representing or spanning different validation criteria in terms of reproducibility um, that uh, you know, essentially offer the, the security model. And I think that makes more sense to break, bake into the sort of protocol layer where rather than, uh, you know, sort of have all these asterisks or addendums saying, you know, uh, well, this bridge is perfectly secure, you know, with an asterisk saying, you know, not all peers have validated it. Um, it should really be built into the protocol and, and sort of in advance for designating stages of these operations that fall under this sort of framework approach versus those that fall under the sort of completely reproducible approach. Um, I think that also offers stronger scaling guarantees when you're talking about the fact that, um, you know, the, the sort of inclusion of data into, uh, into a single hash reference, uh, you know, a compounding hash reference is, uh, uh, you know, creates this, uh, this, this situation where you have, you know, vast, uh, you know, fee explosions during periods of time. Um, and I think it, it sort of makes more sense if you're thinking about it as a sort of pub sub model where, which really, uh, uh, you know, reflects the current phenomenon you see where um, there are potentially many different applications. You might have a, you know, a file coin, you might have a, a you know, an execution coin, you might have uh, dozens of different networks involved in a more complicated uh, stack. Um, and each of those is essentially following a pub sub approach for who the peers are validating, which means there's not a single source of security. It's, it's a, essentially closer to a market where you have multiple providers of security. You have people bidding on the security and sort of ranking that as opposed to a walled garden of security where you have essentially one, per, you know, one, one group of peers that has decided everything falls under this exact security model. Um, this is sort of why you get a new network spawning up all the time, right? Is because uh, that that model does not account for, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, creating a market for security. So, you know, just to just to kind of take a moment for the, the community to kind of understand what Ryle's talking about um, is really kind of addressing a question that many people out in Twitter are saying like, oh, haven't we heard enough from enough infrastructures and new networks? And we keep seeing all these new networks and it seems like they're solving all these scalability problems. Uh, but a lot of what Constellation goes back to the core is that we believe that um, immutability and auditability uh, needs to be the core of every tech stack. Uh, and in order to do that, um, you can't use what existing networks are doing today. 
Um, this is also why we're not seeing true composability. Uh, and this also really opens up to what Constellation is doing different and how we see the world that everybody should be able to use um, a, a blockchain-like uh, feature and functionality inside of every piece of programming that they're doing. And this is our approach into kind of realizing those tools uh, and infrastructure, infrastructure layer tools that developers can do. And so, you know, kind of segueing a little bit is that I wanted Ryle to really talk about um, some of his work with the, uh, the Department of Defense and really kind of what that uh, demo looks like. He was the one kind of guiding them through the process, um, guiding them away from uh, the correlation between us and Ethereum um, and really showcasing our consensus mechanism and really our, our approach and why we are the only ones doing what we're doing uh, at the Department of Defense level. Yeah, so, you know, again, I can't talk in, in extreme detail other than to sort of highlight the sort of general product area that this, that the, the, the uh, you know, some sort of on-prem deployment requires. Um, I think a, a lot of people fall into this exact same situation. Uh, where there are lots of big businesses that are interested in sort of gaining the security benefits. I think in this case, uh, you know, the, the, the desire for security is sort of a lot higher than a customer like Walmart or some other large corporation. Um, you know, the security emphasis is just is sort of overwhelming. And the, the, the it's goals... a fringe case. It's a very yeah. fringe, fringe use case, but yet some of the functionality uh, and what we built with them can be applied to really any business. Exactly. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, I don't want to talk about any specifics associated with their, you know, their sort of internal deployment or their, their use case or anything like that. But from a product perspective, um, I think there's a ton of people that are interested in this problem, uh, which is essentially having, you know, a hybridized style networks, which is something that it doesn't really fit into a world platform sort of use case that it, it is much closer to the, the phenomenon of bridges and peer subsets, where you have some validators that are operating that are going to be the only ones that can possibly validate some piece of data, but they're the only ones that can validate some piece of data in a large pipeline of data. Um, and that means, you know, uh, essentially, uh, you're trying to span on-prem nodes that can validate certain portions of data. You want security and decentralization even within that on-prem subset. You might have sort of external vendors or external partners or external integrators that can that you also want to connect with, that you also want them to run some sort of validation, which may overlap to some degree, but not overlap on every operation. Um, and you have uh, lots of non-reproducible consensus elements. So this means large numbers of integrations with sort of internal products, internal systems, internal data that all matches sort of Oracle uh, patterns or, uh, you know, things that rely on REST queries, for instance, that are extremely difficult to guarantee you have a layer of determinism associated with them. Um, that essentially require some sort of framework model, but then they also need to connect to other internal applications that uh, uh, do sort of do not fit into that, like uh, fixed executor contracts that are going to run across and between these sort of nodes. Um, I think that makes it, uh, you know, a lot more advantageous to view this as something that is a, you know, a pipeline of many steps, some of which are reproducible, some of which are not, and that uh, integrate and connect with other decentralized systems. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of the major requirements are around per file permissioning so that, uh, all, you know, different peer subsets can act as validators to different operations. You need to have integrations with, um, uh, you know, IPFS-like storage that has additional encryption layers on top of it. Uh, so it's it's much more complicated than, uh, uh, you know, a simple operation like that. Um, and, you know, again, we want, it, it needs to have a potential integration paths to uh, other networks that can support uh, sort of different kinds of network contracts and, and fixed operations uh, at the same time as supporting a framework uh, over these sort of custom data types. Um, I think one of the things that's, that's most important of all to them is that from a security perspective, uh, you know, uh, proof of stake is completely meaningless. It, it, it has zero meaning. You know, if somebody bought up all the network, they're not, they're not going to care who that validator is, right? Like, um, it, it, it's uh, complete, all, like for the portions that deal with some of the hybrid integrations across external vendors, 
Uh, there's an argument there that it could be made that, that some of those vendors might, you know, there might be some way you can deal with the contracts associated with that. But uh, as a security model, it, it just really um, sort of doesn't doesn't hold up. And then proof of work here is also completely unusable. If you're talking about something that has, uh, you know, lower latency requirements, lower computing requirements, or has to scale much, much, much larger, uh, you know, you know, telling them that we need to create sort of an internal arms race for uh, an on-prem deployment is, is just a non-starter. Um, and, uh, you know, so this, this leads us into the, the sort of model that we're presenting them, that, which is the, the model that we're using internally, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, individual peer score assignments, uh, which are known as, you know, reputation or trust models. Um, so I'd say, you know, uh, th this is, uh, you know, definitely, we, this is definitely something that is interesting uh, to people who are dealing with uh, on-prem or or don't have a, a meaning of a proof of stake or a proof of work. I think it uh, sort of exhibits it as being extremely more, more important uh, and sort of more fundamental than what is going on, um, which gets into, uh, and this ties exactly to what we were talking about earlier with this break of, uh, of considering everything associated with a, a single peer subset. I think a lot of that makes sense and, uh, you know, a lot of proof of stake thing has, you know, apart from the edge cases where you have somebody who owns 90% of it or whatever, um, even the, the smaller edge cases get into the, the question of, uh, you know, how do you deal with that across a bridge, right? If you have different peer subsets, how do you deal with stake across that? Like, you could just have a fracture across that and then the sort of stake is, is meaningless. You can have mutual deposits across it. It gets into super complicated scenarios. Um, I think what makes sense is to sort of take a step back and, and ask the question, like, how did these products get released, right? I think, uh, you know, Vitalik has said many times the underlying security mechanism against a failure, even in proof of stake or a software code problem is social proof, right? So you have, uh, you know, if you're trying to figure out what Ethereum, I'm sure there's tons of Ethereum hard forks out there that represent, you know, scammers trying to convince you that this is the new Ethereum network. I think a lot of people will, will, you know, check Twitter, check Vitalik's statement. What is the current active Ethereum hash? What is the current hard fork? What is the current software version? None of those questions are are answered by proof of work or proof of stake. They're, they're a step that happens before, right? The, the question of if we're doing a hard fork, who is deciding what that hard fork is? Um, that's a social proof question. That is a sort of random, you know, organization of people deciding uh, to run different nodes. And there is zero automation behind this. There is there's zero modeling. Um, there's the opportunity to introduce attacks and things like that. Really what they're replicating is a process that happens internally where people view the existing peers uh, that they know that are relatively well known. They'll go and check, you know, uh, you know, but they'll check the GitHub, they'll check Vitalik, they'll see who's contributing to the project, they'll make sure that they're on the correct fork by comparing it against peers that they already know, which means there is a, an implicit model happening right now, where people are not, you know, not checking, oh, you know, does this person own a certain amount before I join this network? No, they're they're looking at who this person is, they're going to join that peer network based on what, uh, you know, what other people have said. Um, that's the underlying security phenomena that protects most of these networks, even if you're not considering a, you know, the short term case. And I think that that is actually more important for us to consider and build on because it affects, uh, these edge cases where you're talking about the DOD or somebody else who doesn't have, who has a more complicated security model. Um, so, so we want to sort of try and capture that information as web of trust. You know, there have been other projects that have attempted to sort of capture this to tie it to key crypto keys and things like that. Um, and it's sort of a relative peer assignment, uh, peer assignment that is designed to replicate that process where uh, uh, these fork decisions right now, they're, they're manually determined a lot of the time where you're deciding between hard forks. And we'd like to, you know, sort of make that it's a relative process where somebody is, a, you know, and signing their internal scores, you know, I, I trust Vitalik, I'm going to go with whatever hard fork he says, um, rather than sort of 
uh, you know, uh, assigning that and then determining transitively what is the most sort of accurate network. Uh, I think a lot of that is is important for automating this because it allows a large flexibility in the actual models that are chosen. You know, it become you can capture all sorts of off chain data. You could uh, you know, automatically assign based on IP ranges or spammer likelihood or connect it to any of the other reputation systems uh, that that establish, you know, real world identity with ZK proofs and, and, you know, any of these other systems that have, you know, Twitter verifications, they have social media proofs, verifications, all of that can feed in as Oracle information that connects to a primary model. Um, and it also allows us to capture a source of determinism, which we can use for tie breaks. Uh, in the event that there are conflicts generated that are uh, not actual conflicts, but just sort of minor conflicts. So next slide. Yeah, yeah. so I think we can move on. Yeah. So to kind of summarize uh, a, a lot of what Ryle's um, talking about and kind of leading into are the, the thoughts that we have and what we're building behind the scenes is something that is truly extensible. And working with the DOD allowed us to kind of see a very complex and fringe use case and then work backwards. We knew what the customer wanted. It was a very extreme use of our network, but that's really what we want to be able to showcase is how uh, complex or is how simple that we can actually really make this. Um, and so all of our work is kind of kind of building blocks on one another, if you will, all the way down to the consensus uh, level and what that can be used for and how extensible and how wide and vast we can use this system for. It's pretty pretty amazing the work that they've put uh, forth over the past like three years in working with the DOD. Um, and so I'm gonna give Ryle a second to take a, a drink of water and maybe even catch his breath. Uh, you can tell his passion and as much research as he's done across really any blockchain out there and really what they're missing. Uh, once again, I think you can start to piece together why we are so different uh, in, the, in the lens of the DOD and why they're leaning on us to produce such a complex system that's really never been invented today. Uh, and so in shifting gears, Ryle's gonna come back in a second to really show how all these building blocks come together over the course uh, of the next year. Um, so in this slide here, we presented this roadmap a little earlier this year. I think we did this uh, in July, um, talking about uh, the multi-phase approach into releasing our new technology. Um, we've uh, completed the testnet phase. Uh, we've completed the phase one. Um, and now we're kind of opening up uh, the, our, our roadmap for 2023. We've heard a lot of criticism from the community that we didn't put dates on there to give us a little bit of flexibility. Um, and so now Ryle's gonna walk through 2023 and how both phase two and phase three come to life over the next uh, year, um, starting with uh, Q1 of 2023. Uh, Ryle, would you wanna walk them through the next year and what you have planned? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the, the sort of first thing that makes sense to show off from a, a a framework perspective, which is a lot of what we've been working on, is, is reusing this sort of existing functionality we have in the currency. Um, so this L0 token standard is designed uh, to sort of build uh, uh, build out, uh, you know, something that can be used sort of instantaneously uh, to, re re you know, really showcase a, a lot of the existing work that has been done before. Um, in terms of offering a currency and making sure that everything we're doing is essentially reusable, um, modular, and can be extended into more complicated application use cases. Um, the other portion is, uh, you know, essentially adding internal wallet support um, through through uh, Rosetta. I, you know, I think we have uh, some operations that are supported right now from the CLI from a wallet perspective, um, but this is not as sophisticated uh, as as in you know what you would expect from Bitcoin CLI. I think Rosetta has has offered a nice uh, standard for inter interacting and integrating with other products. Um, and, you know, we would want, want to sort of, you know, start getting experimental support for that. And you know, maybe, maybe not all the features of it are supported. Um, it has a large number of features uh, attached to it, but just sort of the basics around being able to, you know, construct transactions relatively simply from a REST API, um, which will help out a lot with the integrations and operations like that. Um, 
Uh, I think the the next order of operation after that, after logically, you know, extending the work we have done already with a currency um, to make that into a framework so that anyone can use and anyone can start a currency based off of that, is really to start extending into more complicated applications. So. Um, I'll discuss in more detail what we mean by, you know, ACI or application chain interface uh, and the sort of translation layer that we're planning on building um, and the sort of reference applications. But this is basically, uh, you know, uh, focused on entirely on, you know, simple reference examples um, and state channels that offer some functionality that show how how to extend instead of using just a currency to extend it to different different more complicated uh, uh, consensus use cases. Um, and these uh, so are sort of the building blocks that you would need to pull in your custom code where you can offer a custom application that has some functionality that you can't find on a conventional platform. Um, and I think this uh, sort of ties in later. Uh, towards, uh, you know, building out this translation layer in more detail, um, offering more uh, stage, uh, more use cases that, uh, you know, uh, mimic common functionality um, and sort of uh, extending from a series of logical building blocks so that all of these things are relatively easy for a developer to find some existing example, uh, you know, find something that matches what that is that they're trying to build uh, and, and have a sort of a, a simple way to you know, copy and paste some example and extend it further. Um, and we'll go into this in more detail in one of the later slides, what we're talking about with the ACI. Um, the other uh, sort of uh, you know, major operation uh, as well is, is sort of extending the, the, the model and enabling it more. I think, so uh, you know, right now we have the, the existing model in place, but it's not used in every area. And we're trying to sort of ensure that it, it, it has uh, you know, more of the network can be opened up. Um, and I think that's a long, gradual process where we need to uh, sort of move slowly um, and ensure we have large amounts of, you know, tests and verifications that everything is working as expected um, and sort of a, a series of security steps where we're testing the network to, to against various attack scenarios. Um, so, you know, I think that is a sort of gradual process that will um, uh, you know, uh, expand out over time, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, start showcasing some of the, the usage of the model. Yeah, thanks, Riley. I think this this roadmap is pretty, uh, pretty detailed, and we're going to go into what an ACI is, what an executor is, uh, get the details of what that really means. Um, from a high level, what this means is that we're starting with early developer adoption, um, you know, very simple currency frameworks that people are familiar in, but want to build it on the hypergraph. Um, and then during the course of the next year, you're going to see a lot more deployments, more documentation coming out, more governance proposals on things like state channel requirements. Um, and we're going to see that evolve through governance. We'll also see it evolve through documentation. And we'll see more use cases that handle more complex operations that Ryle's talking to and really kind of use um, our, our protocol to the extent that we think it can be done. Um, this is a very powerful year. A lot of stuff is happening and getting deployed uh, in the course of just one year uh, that really kind of will have that snowball effect and create that viral uh, adoption that we're aiming for. So to kind of break it down, um, our first, what was what we just highlighted on Q1 2023 is really around our SDK features. Um, and what what can people expect with the new SDK coming up in Q1? Yeah, uh, so I think you know one of the biggest uh, issues is just sort of a clarification around uh, what is an SDK, what is a framework, what is an executor SDK. Uh, I see this question all the time. Uh, you know, everything we're working on in my mind is is sort of a portion of an SDK. It's something that you can pull in as code that you can use in different aspects. Um, the portion that we're working on uh, most immediately to offer is the one that offers the most customization, which is the ability to extend consensus as a framework, um, pull in custom code, pull in you know REST API queries, whatever, whatever sort of customization you want around that is what we're trying to offer as the initial set of applications because it offers this uh, tremendous level of flexibility um, versus sort of you know fixed executor contracts. Um, the executor SDK that we're working on, the main goal initially is to offer this as a translation layer between these separate applications. So 
for things like functions of plus one. That is something that is so obviously translatable between different applications. It doesn't require any customization that we would view that the, the executor operations as being some way to internally take one of these framework style applications and be able to translate schemas and functions between them when they fall into a common L0 layer. Um, the goal of that, you know, distinguishment, it still requires a portion of the SDK. Uh, it would essentially be uh, part of the main application. It would also offer sort of, you know, fixed executor contracts in addition to this uh, sort of translation layer. Um, so again, the main sort of offering or immediate release in the future is around the currency framework SDK which uh, is going to support, you know, the exact same standard that we're offering. It will offer updates and upgrades that are consistent with our network. Um, we're hoping to eventually extend uh, that functionality to all the other integrations that we're offering um, and, you know, regain all the functionality that we that we have invested time in uh, in, in supporting this currency to anyone who wants it, wanted to launch that. Um, and anyone who wants to uh, launch that would ideally be expecting an upgrade path to using this so that you're not locked in uh, and you can sort of continue to take this as the initial example that connects you to the network and extend this in the future to more complex use cases. So again, this would act as a reference implementation. There would be documentation and onboarding guides um, that would allow you to uh, uh, sort of use this instantaneously. And we'd expect that, uh, now, you know, to logically uh, translate into the next uh, level of customization and, and specification to your application. Just to, um, um, just to quickly jump in on the, the currency framework, I just want to sort of under, underline it at a, at a high level because it is, uh, it is pretty exciting. Um, and it's, you know, one of the next major features we'll, we'll be releasing. Um, so the currency framework is, you know, the first iteration of the SDK. Um, so if you see, you know, you saw the SDK in a previous roadmap and you don't see it now, that's the, that's the currency framework. Um, and so it's aimed at currency, uh, currency use cases, obviously. Um, and so this is going to be the base that will allow um, L0 tokens to launch. And like Raul was describing, it's, you know, one of the core um, ideas behind it is that it needs to be extensible and upgradable. Um, so there's always an upgrade path, you know, it'll be locked in, uh, you know, if you, if you start building early uh, with kind of a limited subset of features, there's always an upgrade path to get to that, to the, you know, later features that are released. Um, so yeah, I'm personally super excited for this, this release, uh, you know, we'll be ready for the first Pioneer state channels to, uh, to build and it's excited to see what everybody builds. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate that. Uh, Eric Carson. Sorry about that. Rob, do you want to jump into kind of the yeah. protocol interdependencies? Um, so I think, you know, everything I've described requires sort of uh, a very large amount of, uh, you know, different working, moving pieces. Um, I think, uh, you know, the going forward, some of the biggest focus is going to be around executors and the translation layer. So this refers to, you know, some way to deal with the portions of customized framework code that do not, uh, 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 that, that, that can actually be translated among each other. So again, this is the, the portion of a pipeline where uh, it can be shared easily as opposed to the portion that cannot. Um, and the other aspect is sort of uh, usability. I think we want to sort of approach this as like a, an HTTP4S like builder pattern where, you know, you are, uh, if you want to add a currency, it's, it's, it's sort of the equivalent to adding a route in an API. Um, obviously, there's more level of complication there. Uh, you know, if you want to add some other sort of common Lego building blocks uh, to your application, these would appear um, uh, essentially is a builder pattern where you can extend it further based on custom data types that are specific to your application. Um, and again, all of this would sort of be in the, in the view of a, 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 you know, a microservice API where your application is viewed as an, as a service API. Um, and there, you know, we would expect them to, uh, multiple, multiple peers to be running multiple different applications, similar to a service mesh. Um, and we want to distinguish what application inputs require uh, validation. Uh, so again, uh, all of this is really uh, all about, um, uh, you know, uh, specifying what portions of your application are going to be required and specifying what portions of your uh, pipeline are going to be required for uh, different steps of validation. So 
Um, the whole goal is to sort of introduce interop layers and introduce uh, um, uh, uh, API equivalents that we're calling the ACI to distinguish, you know, sort of what operations are chain related versus what operations are, you know, uh, essentially simple modifications of uh, the existing state of the application. Uh, so next slide. Um, so again, for this this ACI thing, I think uh, the, the sort of logical analogy here is for common translation layers. You know, if we're, we're talking about a currency in terms of a, 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 a an application chain infrastructure, the analogy here would be to some common, commonly used API. If we have something like Bodo or the, the S3 API, this is used or implemented by dozens of different file sharing and file storage services. Uh, it's a common interop layer that is used by many of these operations and the request and schema types associated with that uh, are all, all sort of well-known and well-established. Um, I think the distinguishment here is that each application might want to have more of the surface area of its API used for mechanisms that are, you know, sort of reading state or reading data out that is sort of, uh, you know, not necessarily important. I'd say the distinguishment here between an ABI is that we're only really interested in capturing things into the ACI that need to undergo validation or need to undergo security. Um, so for where it's something like, uh, you know, you have some specific state embedded in here, your application might want to offer a more complex API, but it might not require that level of uh, um, uh, sort of re-verification on the read side. On the right side for the inputs um, for an ACI, we need to distinguish data that uh, needs to undergo chain interaction. So, you know, this would be the equivalent of a, you know, a sort of redeem operation or deposit operation or any other operation uh, that needs to undergo consensus under chain data. Um, that is what needs to be sort of captured by this uh, chain interface. And it refers to, it should match what a microservice API looks like, except having data types that are specific to requests that need to undergo consensus. Um, and we uh, sort of obviously want portions of those to match this S3 pattern, where if you have a large number of L0 common data types, um, your application would be able to automatically connect and, and handle validation for any other application that's using those common data types. I'll hand it over. Thanks so much, Ryle, for giving over that uh, clarity on the ACI executors, the SDK, and the roadmap. Um, Ryle's going to be uh, doing a, uh, what is it, tour spaces with the DAG chads later today. He'll be doing that alongside Wyatt. Uh, to really go into what does all this mean uh, and how do I start using that um, when I'm designing an application. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to, to Alex uh, to really talk through what this means for the developer ecosystem and what uh, type of support we're going to offer the developer ecosystem uh, and what to expect. Yeah, great. Um... Yeah, so I guess I guess first, uh, what is a developer ecosystem? What are we what are we talking about here? Um, talking about the ecosystem of developers that's building apps on top of the network, um, and you know, in, in a lot of ways, they're responding to these protocol roadmap features that um, that we've been talking about today. Um, so I think we're going to see the number of ways to build on the network and participate grow quite a bit this year. Um, so just want to kind of give a little overview of what's happening now and what we can expect. Um, over that time period. Um, so the first thing is is multiple token standards. Um, I think in the past, a lot of the time when L0 tokens were, were talked about, we're talking about it as sort of a singular token type, um, a currency style token, something like an ERC-20. Um, we should really be thinking about multiple standards, uh, token standards for different use cases. So, you know, currency use cases, um, identity, uh, multiple types of NF NFT uh, use cases. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be seeing those sorts of standards come come down and come through um, our governance process so that it can be kind of discussed with the community and adopted if you know if um, if uh, it, it passes that that process. So um, the next thing, um, maybe this one's uh, obvious, but you know we're gonna see support for L zero tokens. Um, being added to ecosystem applications. So um, L0 tokens are going to be supported in DAG Explorer, Stargazer Wallet, 
uh, and developer packages. We're also gonna see those developer packages expand to cover more languages. Um, currently, we've been focused on uh, Scala on the protocol side and TypeScript, JavaScript uh, on the kind of user land uh, package side. Uh, we'll, we, we'll see languages like Python, Golang, potentially a few others um, have, have developer packages added um, so that you know you can you can use the, the language that you're familiar with to build on top of the network. Um, and then this one I'm particularly excited about. Uh, we are opening up a new position on uh, on the core team. Uh, the, uh, it's, we're calling it a developer advocate. And so um, this is a person that's going to you know work directly with developers in the community to um, to you know create tutorials, example apps, uh, make sure documentation is up to date and accurate. Um, and then communicate directly with developers um, through Discord, <clears throat> excuse me, through Discord, Telegram, um, whatever channels they're using, um, and just really open up a, a line of communication between uh, developers working with the network and, uh, and the core team so we can have that feedback loop. Um, so um, the question is, how can, how can you contribute? Um, really, the, the best way to contribute is to build something on the network. Um, so that may be that may be a state channel uh, if you want to build a state channel, but there are a ton of other projects that um, that you can take on working with the network. Um, we encourage you to use our or the the Stardust Collective um, open source projects as as a guide or a jumping off point. Um, so that's you know Dag Explorer, Stargazer Wallet, Dag 4 JS, a few others. Uh, the you know complete source code is available. You can um, you can go and and. Uh, make a pull request if you want to add a feature, um, or you're welcome to fork it. You can copy, borrow, steal, uh, whatever you want. Uh, create something new with the with the code, and um, you know, feel free to reach out to us on on Discord, and we'll we'll help you however we can. Um, you know, the the ultimate goal is to have multiple competing wallets, explorers, projects. Um, we'd love to see the community projects pop up. Um, so you know, uh, we definitely encourage you to to do that, and we're happy to help however we can. Um, if you would like to make any changes to the core protocol, that's the tessellation repo, um, the best way to do that is going to be to submit ideas through governance. Um, at a certain point along the way, that's going to require um, a reference implementation, and then that'll kind of give the, the proper place for discussions to happen around that feature and if it's something that the community wants to, uh, to adopt. And um, if we jump to the next slide here. So just wanted to give a quick uh, quick shout out. Uh, we have some open positions on on the core team. Um, so you know if if this is something that interests you and you have the right skill set, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so that you know we've got uh, protocol engineer openings. So the skill set there would be uh, functional Scala, um, distrib distributed systems background, um, and uh, full stack Web three engineer. That would be primarily working on uh, on Lattice. Um, so that would be a, a JavaScript background, React, and Node.js. Um, we have product manager role open, also working on the Lattice and, uh, and Stargazer. And then a couple of roles open uh, in governance. Uh, and those would be, you know, working to facilitate ideas uh, through the governance process, get ideas from the community, um, you know, into a position where they can be fleshed out and then voted on uh, by everyone. So. If any of that sounds uh, interesting to you and, and you, you think you'd like to give it a try, uh, definitely check out constellationnetwork.io slash jobs and you can apply there. Thank you, Alex. That was awesome. Um, exciting to be building out the team. Uh, this is really the time now for us to really scale out this company. Um, the tooling's there, the foundation's there. Uh, we're ready to, to blow up. I'm excited. Um, this is awesome. Great work on this, Alex. Uh, Ryle, thank you so much for giving your overview, talking through design choices, the protocol roadmap. Um, always impressed by what you guys are building and the thought behind everything. Uh, I think we're ripe for a really, really big 2023 uh, with massive scaling opportunities. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, this is an exciting uh, hypergraph hour. I know I didn't get to say much. I didn't need to say much. I did my piece last week, but these guys uh, bring a different perspective, show you what's going on behind the scenes, uh, and really how to participate, follow along, and get going. So um, if I don't see you all, 
before now and the end of the year. Have amazing holidays and a happy new year. Uh, look forward to doing